Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Wilkes Wednesday webinars. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I'm Margaret Steele, and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at Wilkes University, which means I'm responsible for alumni engagement, university fundraising, and the respective stewardship of those relationships and donations. Our past webinars, as well as today's webinar, is recorded for future viewing and is available on the Wilkes Alumni Association webpage. You know, we are so very fortunate as an institution of higher education to be able to draw on reliable and evidence-based expertise from our faculty and staff, and even from our student body as we learn and grow together. Today's webinar includes various topics related to climate change. It was intentional to time this webinar around Earth Day. Since its inception in 1970, Earth Day continues to grow as a worldwide phenomenon focused on promoting a healthy and sustainable habitat for people and wildlife alike. Celebrating Earth Day serves as a conscious reminder of how fragile our planet is and how important it is to protect it. You may have noted this webinar also serves to honor the memory of John Anthony Borzell, lovingly known as Bino. He graduated in 2011 in our Earth and Environmental Science program. Since his passing every year on Earth Day, his family makes a significant contribution to the Bino Brazil Memorial Scholarship, which comes from a variety of fundraising efforts. Bino's family established this to recognize his character of living life to the fullest, along with his personal respect for the environment. The scholarship is awarded annually to a student majoring in the sciences with a preference to earth and environmental science. The student recipient must have a demonstrated interest in scientific research, as well as an interest in the environment. You are all welcome to support this effort by going to wilkes.edu backslash give. Now let's get started with some housekeeping notes. Please use the chat feature to let us know that you're here today and just remember to change the settings to all panelists and attendees. You may also use the Q&A to ask questions of our panelists and we'll moderate those for you. Now let's take note of our slate of speakers today, all of whom have worked here on campus. Each of them will spend time on topics related to their respective areas of expertise. Now let's get started with a little bit of information about them. Dr. Matt Finkenbinder. Dr. Finkenbinder is an assistant professor of geology at Wilkes, as well as a sedimentary geologist. His primary research areas include paleoclimatology, quaternary stratigraphy, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Stable isotype geochemistry, paleolimnology, and radiometric dating methods. His research focuses on reconstructing past climate change on a range of timescapes, in including using the sedimentary record from small lakes. His current research projects include lake sediment based projects in the interior of Alaska, the Brooks Range in Northwest Alaska the Northern Rocky Mountains of Montana, the Great Lakes region of Southern Ontario, and Bonnie Bay in West Central Newfoundland. Dr. Finkenbinder teaches a variety of introductory and upper level undergraduate courses in geoscience and environmental sciences in support of their department. Our second speaker, Dr. Ned Fetcher, is a coordinator for the Institute for Environmental Science and Sustainability at Wilkes. His research includes ecology and demography of plants in the Arctic tundra, physiological ecology of tropical plants, and food webs of grasslands in Eastern Pennsylvania, 
as well as the topic at hand, climate change. Ned received his PhD from Colorado State University and also received a Bullard Fellowship from Harvard University. Professor and Chair of Biology, Dr. Ken Klimo, is involved with students in the classroom and through extensive field research. While most students know him as the professor for the spring semester principal of modern biology course, biology maker, majors all take one of his upper, upper level offerings. They include ecology, field botany, medical botany, and plant diversity. Dr. Klimo has incorporated the talents of many undergraduates into his research program on projects ranging from wetland ecology and mapping to medicinal attributes of plants. He also serves as the curator and director of Wilkes Rosenthal Herbarium and its Wetland and Restor Restoration Ecology Laboratory. Finally, we have Dr. Marlena Troy, who's an environmental engineer with specialized expertise in environmental management and biological treatment techniques for remediation. Marlene is currently professor and chair of the environmental engineering and director of the sustainability management certificate program here at Wilkes. Her current research activities include collaboration with colleagues in our SEDU School of Business and Leadership related to the challenges SMEs, which are small and medium-sized enterprises, have regarding implementing sustainable practices. Now let's get started with Dr. Matt Finkenbinder. Thanks for the introduction, Margaret. I think I have to simplify my, my bio sketch there. It's a little bit lengthy. I, tr I, I had to go over and seek counsel on quaternary stratigraphy from uh, other people and I still messed it up, Matt. It's just recently deposited layers of sediment. <laughs> I wish I had known to pronounce it that way. That's okay. That's I, I should what have I was trying to pull off. <laughs> Lesson learned on my part. Okay, I will share my screen. Thank you. Oh, geez. One, two. Okay. I should be an expert at this by now, but it's always a task. Okay. Okay, is that coming through? I think I'm uh, a little confused, but is it projected? It looks good. Good, okay. Uh -huh. All right, uh, well, thanks again for the introduction, Margaret. Uh, so I'm happy to be here again. I'm Dr. Matt Finkenbinder. I'm a geology, assistant professor of geology at Wilkes. <clears throat> and uh, what I wanna talk to you all about today is uh, some of my uh, lake sediment based uh, climate change or paleoclimate research that I've been doing at Wilkes. Um, over the last several years uh, with undergraduate students in the EES department. Um, the kind of first order question that we wanna answer here is uh, how do we know about climate before we actually have instrumental observations of temperature and precipitation? And so uh, in this presentation, what I'm gonna focus on is a brief overview of recent or modern climate change. And then I'm gonna use that as a springboard to talk about methods that we can use uh, in geology and in biology to reconstruct uh, much longer term climate changes that go back uh, potentially thousands or tens of thousands of years. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the method I'll use here is uh, lakes. Uh, in essence, simply the mud or the muck that accumulates at the bottom of lakes over geological time scales. Okay, uh, first order question though, uh, kind of stepping back, you know, really uh, umbrella view is what is climate? And importantly, uh, how is climate different than weather? Uh, a good analogy here is that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And so we think of, you know, weather as uh, really the day to day or the minute to minute, you know, variation of the atmosphere. Uh, it's the, you know, short term variations. Um, right now outside Wilkes-Barre, it's, it's like sleeting. It's uh, actually pretty unexpected, but it's, uh, it's certainly quite cold and rainy. Uh, and then, you know, climate is different in that climate is really the long term average of weather conditions. Uh, and so we typically need about 30 years or so of weather data. 
Uh, and then from that, we can calculate things like the average annual temperature or precipitation. Okay, so uh, following up on this then, we wanna look at what we know about modern climate variability. And so uh, this is a plot that shows uh, the instrumental record of global temperatures going back uh, to about 1880 CE up to the present. And so we've got, uh, you know, age on the x-axis and then we have temperature on the y-axis. And, you know, what this shows is that it's kind of cool. It's, it's colder early on. And those cold temperatures uh, end up kind of giving way to progressively warmer temperatures over time. And so what this shows is uh, over the last 120 years or so, we see globally about 1.4 degrees C warming, which is about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit of warming over this time. And uh, you know, from this, as a scientist, we have so many questions. Um, you know, keeping in mind that the Earth is over 4.6 billion years old, and you know, this record is only about 140 years old. So it's very short in the context of Earth's history. So uh, some you know, basic questions that we have is, you know, how unusual are these changes? Uh, what we see over this period of time is, is warming, uh, you know, global warming or rapid warming of Earth's average surface temperature. Uh, secondly, what explains the warming? And so what mechanisms operating in the climate system explain this recent uptick in temperatures? And then, uh, you know, uh, again, the Earth is really old, 4.6 billion years. And so how did climate vary before this instrumental record? Okay, so a bit more about the, the mechanism or the reason. Uh, what we have here is a couple of plots that show the atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so the atmospheric CO2 levels going back over time. And uh, we have pretty good records of atmospheric greenhouse gases and CO2 going back to about 1957. And this is coming from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And so in Hawaii, they've been collecting um, uh, air samples going back to 1957. And uh, the scientists there have been measuring uh, the, the chemical content of the atmosphere. And what we see is that the CO2 levels have been rising more or less steadily over time. And so back in 1957, it was about 320, uh, it's called parts per million, which is a really small number. Uh, but over time, we see this pretty big ramp up and now we're at about 415 or so parts per million. So uh, we've got a major increase in greenhouse gases and you know, scientists know that this uptick or this increase in CO2 is related to human activities. Uh, in particular, it's fossil fuel combustion, it's burning, uh, you know, petroleum or oil, uh, natural gas and coal, and uh, also land use change and deforestation. And those really kind of collective processes um, have been releasing lots of carbon into the atmosphere. And as a result, this is enhancing the greenhouse effect. And this is in large part why uh, we have this recent increase in temperatures. Okay, so again, recall, uh, keep in mind the Earth is, is super old, 4.6 billion years old. And so, you know, what we know about climate, uh, about modern climate is a snapshot, a very kind of short period of time in the context of Earth history. And so what we need to do is uh, analyze what are called paleoclimate archives. And so a paleoclimate archive is a natural material that either grows or accumulates over time. And importantly, uh, that archive has to be able to be dated. We have to kind of figure out how old the material is. <clears throat> we also have to be able to measure something in the archive <clears throat> and in turn relate that measurement to something about climate. And usually uh, it's a measurement that tells us about either precipitation or temperature. So uh, many different options here shown on the left-hand side. We have things like tree rings, uh, ice cores, uh, sediment cores from lakes uh, uh, in the oceans and also sedimentary rocks. And uh, the focus of my research is on lake sediment cores. And so those lake sediment cores can tell you something about climate going back potentially tens of thousands of years uh, into the past. Okay, so how this works, uh, why and how lakes are paleoclimate archives. So uh, a lake is just simply a basin, a low-lying area on land. 
uh, we know that it, you know, obviously fills up with water, but also over geological time scales, the lake will fill up with sediment or weathered material that forms on land. And so over time, lakes trap sediments. They, they trap detritus or weathered material, and they end up filling in from the bottom, uh, moving up to the top over time. The way it works then is as the climate changes, so do the inputs of sediment to the lake. And so over time, that produces a layered archive um, of those past climate or environmental conditions. And so what we can do as scientists is we can go to the lake and we can uh, basically push tubes uh, or, or uh, hollow cylinders into the floor of the lake and we can collect these core samples for analysis. And in turn, the analysis of those core samples tells us about this ancient climate. Okay, so there's a lot to this. I'll just kind of keep it brief and say that, you know, the first part is field work. Um, field work is, you know, by far and away the best part. This is where we get to go outside. We get to, you know, really visit lots of amazing places, um, lots of camping, lots of being outdoors. Um, what we typically do in the summer is we will uh, take a couple boats, uh, we'll build a raft or a frame on top of those boats, and then we end up collecting core samples down through the actual water column of the lake. Uh, what we have is a tube. This is um, uh, EES uh, alumni Dan Barada, who I think might be here uh, on the webinar. Uh, but there's Dan uh, in Montana with myself, and we are collecting core samples uh, from Rock Lake, uh, which is a lake in northwest Montana. And so we just push down these tubes into the muck or into the mud, we pull them back up, and in turn, um, it's basically just a cylinder of that sediment at the floor of the lake. Okay, so then we, uh, we come back to the lab at Wilkes, and we uh, end up analyzing the cores. Um, it's a lot of lab work. Uh, the first, uh, first part is kind of basically just opening up the core itself. We split it in half, we describe it. Um, I like to think that we kind of slice and dice it and we subsample it and we analyze the cores for many different chemical, biological and geological methods. Um, and in turn, uh, that's basically our window into the past that helps us understand that ancient climate. So another really big part of this analysis is that we have to figure out how old the lake sediment cores are. Um, and so uh, the example shown here, there's a, a sediment core image at the top of the slide. It shows there's all these different colors, these different kind of layers in the core. And uh, what we wanna do then is figure out the depth of each of those intervals in the core. And so to do that, we take samples of organic materials, things like wood or twigs or charcoal, and we analyze those for carbon dating. And the carbon dating method then in turn tells us when those sediments deposited. And in turn, that's how we know when things happened in the past. Okay, so uh, an overview, a very brief overview of kind of things that I've been doing over the last several years. And so uh, we got a map here of North America and this shows some, uh, some current and also some past research projects. Uh, that myself and my students have been doing at Wilkes. Uh, the objective of really all of these studies is to reconstruct climate, uh, to evaluate really the long-term patterns of temperature and precipitation, um, uh, really going back again, thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. And the motivation for this is really just to kind of uh, help understand, better understand modern climate and kind of how uh, the climate system has operated naturally over longer geological timescales. Okay, so I'm gonna talk briefly about one example, which is in Pennsylvania, and that is the uh, New Angola Lake sediment record. Uh, New Angola Lake is uh, about 10 or 15 minutes or so south from the Wilkes campus. Uh, and so the map shows, you know, uh, uh, Wilkesbury up here in the valley, and then we have New Angola Lake uh, right down here. And then for reference, Hazleton is down at the south end of the map. Okay, so uh, it turns out, I found out pretty soon when I came to Wilkes that we own uh, uh, the south parcel of the lake, uh, which is a filled in bog. Uh, and so Dr. Klimo told me that back in 2017, and um, pretty, pretty soon after we went uh, to the lake, uh, with classes, we collected uh, sediment cores for class and research projects in 2017 and 2018. 
And the objective or the motivation of this project specifically was to assess or determine the time that the last ice age ice sheet actually melted and retreated back off the landscape. And it turns out that there's really no data, no existing data for this uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so because of that kind of dearth of data, uh, uh, I was motivated to kind of, uh, you know, look into this issue. Okay, so step one field work again, we went to the lake or the bog at the south end of the lake. Um, we collected 12 meters of sediment cores from the lake, uh, which turns out to be about 40 feet of sediment. And, you know, my goodness, 40 feet of sediment is an enormous pile of sediment. And so it was pretty surprising. Um, and we got, you know, a really nice record of sediment uh, that, that really kind of goes back to the time when the ice sheet pulled back off the lake basin. Okay, so I'll show you just one result slide. This is um, uh, an image that shows what the core looks like from 10 meters on the left down to 12 meters on the right below the actual floor of the lake. And so this is way down below the modern surface of the lake. And so we've got uh, depth on the x-axis, then we've got just kind of the picture of the core. And what it shows is the transition from when the glacier was actually in, uh, uh, in the watershed or in the catchment. This is very uh, highly dense, uh, has lots of mineral matter, and it has not that much organic matter. But over time, I think you can see that it gets a little bit darker. And so the deglacial sediment is increasingly more organic, and the post-glacial sediment is kind of what we expect to see right now, which indicates more kind of warm and wet conditions. Okay, so here's the result. This is the preliminary data from the lake. And what it shows is that we have a single radiocarbon date of 19,200 years near the bottom of the core sequence. And so what this tells us is that the, uh, the ice sheet, which covered parts of Northeast PA, melted by 19,000 years ago. And so uh, the time prior to that was very cold um, and windy and typically dry. And so increasingly after 19,000 years ago, um, the landscape got warmer, it got wetter, and gradually over time, uh, we kind of transitioned into a more similar to modern type climate. Okay, so in conclusion, um, uh, the point I wanna make here is that, you know, we have to really understand ancient climate which helps us look into the modern. And so we use again, these paleoclimate records from lakes. And I would argue that this uh, really provides a good perspective on continental climate variability. Uh, more to our programs at Wilkes, uh, you know, when we do this work, we work with students directly, uh, you know, in classes and also with research projects. And uh, I would just leave it at the end to say that, you know, climate change and climate science is a really big part of our Wilkes curriculum uh, that we teach, uh, you know, in our EES programs and in our biology programs. Wonderful, that's, Matt. That's Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, before we move on to Ned, um, we have one question for you in our Q and A here, um, and it is from Neil McHugh. Neil McHugh. Neil is actually um, a member of our alumni association board. Um, and he is wondering if you've ever had core sampling that showed a significant anomaly or event that's not consistent with current climate data. Oh, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I, I guess the answer is, um, you know, I've been working all across North America for the last 10 years. And so we, we, we do find surprising things. Um, um, you know, one of the, I think the most surprising things that I've seen working in the Rocky Mountains uh, in British Columbia and Montana, uh, those those uh, projects are more so focused on looking at precipitation and drought variability. And you know, one of the things that we see in the American West is that there are periods of time going back, let's say, six thousand years ago or before, that were much drier than what we see right now. Um, and so that's pretty curious and interesting because it has implications for things like water resource management and, you know, water use policy. Um, so, yeah, we, we always see surprising things um, and, and, you know, uh, that's okay. Um, you know, we're just trying to really learn about, you know, longer term variability, how that compares with the modern 
and in turn, what perspective that gives us about the past. Well, thank you so very much, Matt. It's, it's clearly the case that um, surprising things lead to more questions and more curiosity. It's the fun of it, isn't it? Yeah, the more you learn, how should I say this? The more you, the more you learn, the more questions you have. There you um, go. So it's a, it's a never ending process. There you go. All right, thanks again. And yeah. now I would like to introduce Ned, Dr. Ned Fetcher um, for his segment of our webinar today. Um, take it away, Ned. Thanks so much for being here. You're still on mute, Ned. All right, uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Let's see, it says it's paused. Maybe I have to start all over again. All right, let's see, share a screen. What's going on? There you go. We have it now, Ned. Okay. So we've been, um, we're going to the Arctic now. Um, like Matt, I've been working in the Arctic for some time. In fact, uh, my first trip there was a year before this picture was taken. We were in Barrow uh, in June in 78, and we were at the uh, Eskimo uh, Whaling uh, Festival or the Inuit Whaling Festival. And these kids, are about uh, to embark on a, what uh, looks like a pretty dubious adventure. The other thing to see is the ice pack that's right off the shore there. Uh, that's the Arctic ice pack. So I've continued working in the Arctic for, uh, I've gone back there in more recent years. And here we are, uh, I was in there in, in July, 2015. Uh, this is what is now called Ukiabik. So um, the climate is not the only thing that's changing in the Arctic. Uh, the native populations are taking more active role in the use and management of the Arctic. And uh, the, uh, the uh, people that live in Ukiabik decided to change the name of Barrow to, uh, to, the, to Ukiabik about three or four years ago. So uh, the other thing to notice is that the ice pack, uh, this is not too much later than when that earlier picture, that ice pack is much as, as gone now. now. This is a consequence of the fact that the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the planet. So the overall average, uh, as Matt pointed out, is about one degree. So the Arctic one degree Celsius, so the Arctic might be warming one and a half to two degrees warmer than it was traditionally. And there are a number of reasons for this, uh, which I can get into uh, in, uh, if, you, if you want to ask me later. One of the big components of the Arctic uh, is what is called tundra. This is a particular kind of tundra called tussock tundra, which is composed of these, uh, these uh, what we call tussocks of a plant called Eriophrum vaginatum uh, or, or cotton grass. It's known as cotton grass. You can see the little tufts here uh, that look like balls of cotton. That's why it's called cotton grass. And uh, what's underneath this is often a layer of peat, organic matter, that could be up to a foot or a foot and a half deep. And this is one of the reasons why we're concerned about warming the Arctic, because we are thinking that uh, there is a concern that as the Arctic warms, a lot of this organic matter is going to decay and release carbon dioxide in the, into the atmosphere. Here's a cross section of some of these tussocks. You can see that there's uh, leaves up here, and then there's a huge mass of roots down here. Uh, sometimes the tussocks get buried by a layer of moss. That would be, this would be sphagnum moss growing right here. We have sphagnum moss growing in our bogs here in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. 
We actually, we also have this plant also is growing in bogs here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. I, last fall, I discovered some about three miles from where we live in uh, Clark Summit. Now this is, um, let's see. So here's a map of Alaska showing some of the sites that we, uh, that we uh, visited. And um, our main research site is along this transect going from Fairbanks all the way to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, and we have a set of, of sites experiments set out here. Our main site is here at the Tulik Lake Field Station. I'll show you some pictures of that later. Uh, also, uh, later on, we're going to go over to the western uh, part and our eastern, the western part of Alaska and see, uh, visit Kotzebue. You see this faint outline here. That's the state of Florida superimposed on this area of northern Alaska. So this whole region here is all tussock tundra. So it is a, it is a huge area of, of all of this vegetation type. So that's one of the reasons why we want to study it is because we're concerned about uh, what happens if it warms up. Now this gives you an idea of the amount of carbon that is tied up in the permafrost. So if we, uh, if we burn all the natural gas, we would release about, we would raise the concentration of, of CO2 in the atmosphere by roughly perhaps 180 parts per million. And the end point would be 581. Uh, this was a few years ago when I put this slide together. So things may have changed a bit. Right now we're at about 420, 416, 416 parts per million. It's going up maybe two or three parts per million every year. If we burn all the coal, we wind up perhaps somewhere around 600 parts per million. But if we release all the carbon that's in the permafrost, then we are at almost 1200 parts per million CO2. And at that point, I think the climate would be, uh, we would be in a very, very different earth. In fact, we might not be here. One of the things that happens as you warm the tundra uh, is you get an increase in the production of shrubs. So here's a picture that was taken in 1911. Uh, this fellow, Kenneth Tape, went back and relocated that site, retook the picture. And you can see that there's an increase in shrubs. That picture of those, this picture was taken perhaps in, oh, somewhere in 2006, 2007. I expect that these shrubs have, have increased even more by now. Here are some tussocks in the foreground. Uh, here's some time-lapse pictures that I've taken. This is one of our sites that's along the uh, Dalton Highway. Uh, this is, we set up an experiment here in 1982. Uh, so you see some stakes marking where the experiment is. When we went back in 2017, you can see that this whole site has been invaded by these spruce trees, uh, which are slowly taking over the site. So now you can't really call, this is certainly what we would call tussock tundra here, but over here, you, it's really hard to call it tussock tundra. So the whole ecosystem is being transformed um, sort of before our eyes. Again, this is our main site, Tulik Lake uh, and uh, tussock tundra. This is a picture taken in 1980 when we were taking up this site. And here it is in 2014. The tundra hasn't changed very much, but you can see that uh, the, uh, this uh, whole, uh, whole field station has a piece. Here's another view of the field station. So this is uh, the, the America's, um, this is uh, the United States' main Arctic field station. As you can see, it's quite an operation. Uh, approximately 100, under normal conditions, i.e. no pandemic, 
there's 120 people here in, in July, the peak season. This is what it looks like in the winter. Um, we have there, this is the view, this is for a view from the webcam about a week ago. Um, and you can see looking south towards the Brooks Range. Uh, this is the lake, the Tulik Lake in the winter. The ice here, they just measured it. Uh, it's a hundred, it's one and a half meters thick. So, you know, five, six feet thick almost. Uh, the only animals that you see up there are caribou. You can see right along here, there are a few specks. Those are caribou. And then of course, here's a close up of the caribou hanging out. But they hang out out there all winter, as well as ravens. There you see ravens. Those are about the only animals they see. But you can uh, visit the website for this station, the Tulik Field Station, and see what they're followed it through the year. It's pretty interesting. Well, here's another picture of the lake. Getting all kinds of stuff showing up on my screen. And uh, let's see, oops. This is this is a sunny day. This was probably the warmest day in the last five years, but uh, again, uh, sort of a beach resort scene, and, this, and the people at the station are are having a beach party. So the water temperature was normally it's about ten or twelve degrees Celsius. Uh, this day I think it was sixteen or eighteen. So you could actually swim around for a while. One of the things that's happening is that fires are becoming more common. Uh, as the climate warms, we're getting more convective storms and more lightning strikes. Uh, this is a view of a tundra fire. I actually took this picture in 1977, but it's, they are becoming more common. Uh, a very, in 2007, there was a very large burn called the Anaktuvik burn. It burned 400 square miles. That's just a little bit smaller than the really big fires that were happening out in California last year. It released uh, a lot of carbon. This is what it looked like the year after that was taken. And then this is a picture was taken in 2015. To give you some idea of the scale of this fire, this is the picture of the burn superimposed on our valley, uh, going all the way from Carbondale down to Natticoke. So that whole area, just imagine an area of that size, uh, completely burned. The fire started in August and burned until, uh, until September when the snow finally put it out. So we're gonna go on a helicopter ride here to go out to see what the burn looks like. We're starting off near the station and we're heading north. Let's see if this works. So we're in a helicopter. We had we set up an experiment out there, so we had to go out and visit. We're flying over, obviously, tundra. There are lakes. Uh, you can see uh, where willows are. And here we are at the burn. You can see the blackened uh, material. You can see tussocks. And you can see all the cotton grass. It's very hard to walk in this terrain, kind of terrain. You have to sort of step between the, between the tussocks. This is some more tundra. This is like flying over some shrubs flying over shrubs and uh, it's kind of snowing or raining. And now we're going along a river bottom uh, and sort of sort of see what the river bottom looks like. And willows and stuff like that. We're about a hundred feet off the deck right now. So here are three, we set up in 2015, we set up an experimental burn to see how the tundra would recover from burning. So we had three Wilkes undergraduates with us that summer, uh, Daryl Deck, uh, Stephen Forney, and uh, Steve Turner, whoops. 
um, those Daryl and Steve Forney were in the biology department. And Steve Turner was in the uh, was in the EES program. Uh, animals are affected by the climate as it gets warmer. The insects become more of an issue. Here is some muskox, and here are some caribou. This is near one of our sites. So they're moving, they're moving pretty fast. You can hardly tell what they're eating. Uh, and I think we think it's, they're moving mostly just to get away, get away from the, uh, from the uh, bugs. So they move pretty fast. There's about 300, we estimate about 300 animals in this herd. This is more caribou than I've ever seen. Out in the western part of Alaska, we have uh, Project Chariot. We went to visit that site, and we visited that in 77. When we got there, it was another warm day, and the, uh, the Inuit people were taking, uh, again, uh, uh, taking a swim. This is north of the Arctic Circle, also uh, doing some hydroplaning in the pound. This was the site that we visited. And then on the way back, we went by Kivalina, which is kind of a poster town. It's about 200 people live here, and they've been trying to move uh, to get away from rising sea levels for probably 10 or 20 years. But so far, they've been unable to come up with the money to do it. It will probably take, uh, I don't know, 400 or $500 million to move this town of about 200 people. So I'll close with three books, uh, like Ezra Klein. This is The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. It's a very good book. And uh, this is by another friend, uh, uh, another good book about grassroots and sustainability. And finally, this is a really interesting book. If any of you have ginseng growing on your property, this is another really interesting book. So thank you. Well, thanks so much, Ned. Um, what, a, what fascinating opportunities for our students um, who got to accompany you to that beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, I know um, they had a great time. They, oh, um, uh, no doubt, no doubt. What a chance of a lifetime. And we have one question for you um, from uh, Wayne Vetter, and he'd like to know, um, what are, what's the primary source um, of your grant funding? Uh, National Science Foundation mainly. Wow. NSF yeah. here at Wilkes. Yeah, that was yeah. all. Yeah, mo most of those pictures, like those students, they were sponsored by the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation maintains the field station. So oh. we've had, since I've been at Wilkes, we've had two grants from, from NSF. Well, it's certainly encouraging to hear that NSF is still supporting basic research. Oh, yeah. yeah no, no doubt about that. No, they've been doing this all along, even, even in the last four years, uh, they're, they've been doing that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much, Ned. And I'm going to um, ask our third speaker, Ken Klimo, to, um, you know, to, to tell us about his work here at the university and beyond. Hi, so I hope you can hear me okay. Yep, we got I'm you. Coming through. Yeah. All right, so let me try to share my screen. Uh oh. All right, I'm not seeing the shared screen uh, come on here. Nope, it's not there. All right. Uh, could you give me screen sharing privileges? It, they should be. You should there. have them. Oh, I just got it. Okay. Okay. There we go. We got you now. Very good. Okay. Um, so what we're doing here, this is sort of a change of pace from the other two presentations um, in that I, I don't look at carbon sequestration or, or uh, global climate change per se, but I think that the uh, research that I do can be adapted uh, to looking at uh, carbon issues. Um, first of all, let me send a greeting to uh, my former students who might be in the, in the audience. 
and then any of my Facebook friends uh, who are also in the, in the audience as well. I'm sure I'll hear this on Facebook in terms of how it went. Uh, but basically what, we're, what, what I do in terms of my own research is I, I like to think of my research um, as being understanding the ecological impacts of energy development. And so whether we're looking at mine reclamation or whether we're looking at um, uh, natural gas um, uh, pipelines, uh, you know, we want to see what, what energy development is doing maybe for us or to us. And so I have my presentation here on uh, planting forests for anthracite mines. And you'll notice here that I have my name and then a whole bunch of names down below. Uh, so I've, I've been fortunate enough uh, to have several waves of students who come uh, uh, through, the, through the pipeline here and, uh, you know, treat them to the, the kind of research that I, get, uh, I do. So anyway, um, for anybody who's been to nor uh, Northeast Pennsylvania knows, uh, we have a problem with coal mining. Uh, I mean, that's our heritage. Uh, coal mining has actually economically built up the region 100, 150, 200 years ago. And in fact, coal mining helped us to win uh, two world wars and probably a civil war as well. But in the meantime, uh, as an ecologist, and in fact, coal mining was one of the reasons I became interested in, in going into ecology, is that you see the coal mining has destroyed lots of land, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres uh, of, of ve both vegetation and soils uh, throughout the Appalachian uh, region. And so if you go out to these sites, um, you'll see that there isn't really much of a soil to talk about uh, what we have is um, basically rock material that doesn't hold water all that well, and the temperatures can be, it can be extremely high, and um, there, there's very little fertility, so very little in the way of calcium or magnesium or, or um, uh, potassium or nitrogen, all the good things that plants need. Uh, instead, what we have is this rocky infertile substrate. Um, this, by the way, uh, this scene is a, an aerial view of, of uh, the Avondale site. And some of you might remember uh, that up until maybe about eight or nine years ago, uh, that the Avondale site featured a large depression that was called the Avondale Pit. And this was viewed as one of the worst um, uh, instances of, of mining uh, devastation uh, that we have in all of Eastern Pennsylvania. So when we have areas that are, in fact, I think what I wanna do is let me, if I can shrink this up a little bit. All right, hopefully that, that's a little bit better. Um, when we have uh, uh, mining areas, we like to, fi to fix them. And so uh, we have this process of mine reclamation, which involves uh, mainly regrading the soil and then also planting some kind of vegetation uh, to try to initiate uh, what we call ecological succession back to our original forest uh, that we used to have before mining. And so uh, it turns out that, that reclamation has actually made its, uh, made its way into uh, legislation, into laws. And so there was a law that was passed back in 1977 the good old disco era uh, that I remember very well. And this is called the Surface Mining Control and, Re and uh, Restoration Act. And so the mandate for the SMECRA, as it's called, uh, the mandate is to regrade the land and to uh, make it nice and compact uh, so that we, we don't get much in the way of erosion. And then we add some, some calcium to the site and then we plant a cover crop of grasses and legumes. Um, most of the plants that are planted are actually not native species, uh, but they're alien species. So this is something that, um, that's been done on, on thousands of acres uh, would be this reclamation of, of uh, creating these, these rolling hills 
and planting the grasses and legumes. Well, the idea here, whoops. The idea here is that this MECRA type of reclamation has some both benefits and drawbacks. And so the benefit of the SMECRA is that number one, you're establishing a ground cover uh, fairly quickly, you know, really within a matter of a year or maybe at most two or three years. And then um, we get a type of vegetation that develops that we can call a meadow vegetation. And this meadow vegetation will attract certain kinds of, of birds that are otherwise not very common in Northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, both birds and insects, particularly butterflies and, and moths are attracted to this kind of area. All right, on the other hand, the, uh, the problem with this uh, type of reclamation is that number one, you are putting a lot of non-natives onto the site. And then number two, uh, you have dense cover of grasses inhibit tree growth. And in fact, it's, it's not only the dense cover of grasses, but also it's the densely uh, compacted soil. And so what you're left with is for decades, uh, a vegetation that's made up mainly of non-native species. And so for those of us who are, who are into organismal diversity and who um, care about you know, rare plants, rare animals and, and invasives, uh, we wanna try to keep uh, our area as free from uh, non-natives as possible and to try to introduce natives where we can. So we have then an, an alternative approach uh, to the SMECRA reclamation. This is a much newer approach that um, directly plants trees onto mine sites. And so this is called the forestry reclamation approach or the FR, FRA, which is probably about 10 to 15 years old at this point. And so this uh, is, is mostly done both in the central and the southern Appalachians. So you go to um, Kentucky or West Virginia or Western Tennessee or some of the other places where uh, they do mainly bituminous mining and you see this forestry reclam reclamation approach uh, being um, implemented. Well, the, the, pro, well, the relationship rather to climate change, you know, why are we talking about this, is that we, we like to plant trees because trees will store carbon in their woody tissues. So including the trunk and the stems and the roots, they store the, the carbon there for decades. Unlike herbaceous plants that will store carbon uh, during the summer months, and then afterwards, uh, the plants die back and release the carbon back into the air again. Um, the, the carbon sequestration is especially good when we're talking about growing trees, actively growing trees, as opposed to older trees, because actively growing trees, you're actually putting on uh, new carbon. And so, um, you know, if we can plant trees on these reclamation sites, uh, we can do a good job of, of um, uh, storing carbon. So the question is, will this FRA, this forestry reclamation approach, will it work in Pennsylvania? And so there are very few places in which the FRA has been attempted in Pennsylvania. One of the places is at the Avondale mine site um, back in 2017. And what happened was that we got a, a bunch of volunteers that planted several thousand uh, different saplings. And so we have uh, native species like white pine, trembling aspen, red oak, white oak, and chestnut. And I think, whoops, I think chestnut oak as well. Um, the idea here is that here you can see where Avondale is located. It's located just uh, west of uh, Plymouth and across the river from Nanakoke. Uh, for those of you who might remember those those towns. And then this is actually showing the actual planting that was done in April of 2017. Uh, I'm over here and um, uh, other students, we have some students that are, that are here planting and having a grand old time doing this. Well, so when, when it came time to planting, we actually entered in, Wilkes entered into an agreement uh, with the Office of Surface Mining 
to monitor the success of the plantings. Very often when these plantings are happening, uh, nobody really monitors their success. And so what we looked at is whether the tree seedlings are surviving at all that have been planted. Do the rates of survival vary between species? Does the tree growth vary between species? And then is this type of reclamation successful in Northern Appalachians? And if it is, then it could be adopted really on a much broader scale. So this was sort of a, um, a, a, a test run right here to see if this, uh, this FRA will work in, in Northern Pennsylvania. And so what did we find? Well, what we did was we set up permanent plots to be able to measure and locate the trees, identify them to species and measure their height and whether they're being predated. Um, here you can see some students who are obviously really hard at work and um, being, no, they're not being fairly miserable. It looks like they're happy being out in the field. This is just wonderful. And so um, the, the findings that we have is, uh, first of all, this is just simply the number of trees that we found um, of each species. And so we had a lot of pine, a lot of aspen. We had some sumac that came in. Sumac is not, was not planted. It just simply came in on its own. Uh, chestnut oak, and then a variety of other species uh, that were either planted or came in on their own. This is probably the most important graph right here. Uh, this shows survival, um, at least from 2017 to 2018. And so you're seeing then from just about all the species that survival exceeded 90 to 95%. So we were really worried whether the trees would actually survive and lo and behold, they're surviving well. I should mention that, that this high survival, although I don't have the, the data quite, uh, quite in hand yet, simply because um, uh, the data is still being worked up. But um, if we take this to 2021, uh, survival is still very good. So we're, we did a really good job as far as that goes. And then this just simply shows height of plants. And so we have aspen that is doing pretty well. Gray birch is doing pretty well. On the other hand, pine um, isn't really growing so much and chestnut uh, chestnut oak isn't really growing all that much. What we could do is we could figure out in terms of the amount of growth, how much carbon is being sequestered by these species. And um, if we were to uh, put these trees all over Appalachia, to what degree can we sequester carbon uh, from burning coal? So our conclusions uh, are that, first of all, the trees appear to be surviving and growing, even though there are some differences between species. Um, we, we've gone out to the site, and as you can imagine, the pandemic really had an, infa an impact on our, um, uh, our, our work last year. But recent observations in the fall and now in the spring indicate that the trees are going through a growth spurt. So, uh, so this is going to be very exciting. And then, as I said here, future research will estimate carbon sequestration uh, within the forest. All right, so that's my little story for you. And so, um, uh, again, this is something that we're actively working on right now. Uh, we're actually going to submit an abstract to the Ecological Society of America meeting. Um, and uh, we, we presented er an earlier version of this work at another meeting, and we got all kinds of invitations uh, to publish this work. And so we're waiting for uh, this latest run, uh, which will be in the spring. And then once we do that, then we can publish. All right, so with that, let me stop sharing my screen. And... Um, I can take whatever questions that you might have. Well, Ken, thank you so much. We do have a question. Um, it, it's a little bit of a statement and, and a question tied into it. So it reads as follows. Engine, en energy companies I have worked for use dredging 
at the docks to maintain draft as needed for vessel access. In the early 2000s, I had several projects where we stabilized our dredge material and sent it to Western Pennsylvania for use in sealing acid mine drainage sites. Do you know if dredged material is a viable fill material for FRA reclamation sites? Okay. I'd have to really look at the dredge material. And, and in fact, it, it really depends upon the amount of carbon that you have in the, in the material. I know that one of the things that trees are, are relatively picky about is the, um, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so one of the things that we'd have to work on then to see whether the dredge material is, would be of use is, is this ratio. Um, of carbon to nitrogen. And if it, if, it, if it is something that would be amenable, uh, that would be something that I could bring to the attention of the Office of Surface Mining and to see to the degree to which um, we can actually have a, a synergy uh, that might develop along these lines. Okay, we have another question from Helen Grebski. Helen wants to know is if the Earth Conservancy projects are in conflict with forest reclamation. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> hmm, all right, how am I gonna handle this one? All right, so, so it, it turns out that the land that we're doing this analysis on is actually state forest. It belongs to uh, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry, and it's part of what we call the Pincho Forests. Um, when, and, and if you were to look at the site, uh, the eastern part of the site abruptly ends, and right over a, a dirt road, on the other side of a dirt road, is Earth Conservancy land, and the Earth Conservancy uh, did their work um, following the uh, the SMECRA, you know, the older type of, of reclamation. Basically, the Earth Conservancy um, uh, had been in, interested in doing reclamation for subsequent development. So there's a lot of area that is um, uh, uh, recreational fields or housing developments, but they do have uh, so, um, some areas that are what they call green space. Uh, but as far as I know, at this point, um, they aren't uh, embracing so much uh, the FRA. All righty. So we have one more question. Any plans of measuring productivity or biomass as a way to assess carbon accumulation? Yeah, that, that, and that would be something that I could easily foresee doing. Um, and in fact, one of the interesting things about our project is that I'm, I'm teaming up with one of Matt Finkenbinder's colleagues, a guy named uh, Dr. G Dr. Bobek Karimi, and he is looking at using drones to assess uh, not only the presence of, uh, of trees, but also looking at uh, their, their growth and their size. And so what I could easily see happening is coming up with a, um, an algorithm or a, a relationship between the size of the plants and how much carbon that they accumulate. So that's a, that's a, a good question. This is research that needs to be conducted really for the next 20 years. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Well, wonderful. I want to take a moment just to thank all of you for, for joining us here this afternoon. It's been fascinating and you know what a what a wonderful opportunity for our alumni to understand the active work that's going on with our students. Um, they, you know, particularly during the pandemic. Um, we haven't had opportunities for our alumni to, to actively view and know what's happening here, still happening on campus. And I know that, um, that all of you are still actively engaged in research and with student research and field opportunities despite the pandemic. So I wanna, I wanna thank you for taking the time. What a broad base of, you know, overlook at, at climate change. Um, um, we just can't thank you enough. 
And we are going to close here today. Dr. Marlene Troy provided a, um, a short video on um, work that's being done, you know, that she's involved in in the Earth and Environmental Sciences side of the, of the campus. We're gonna close with that and wanna thank all of our audience participants and let you know, again, this has been recorded and we will have it on the Wilkes University Alumni Association webpage. And thanks so much. And Mary, if you want to pull up the video, that would be wonderful. Having some trouble there, Mary? Environmental Engineering in the Department of Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences here at Wilkes University. And it's my uh, privilege to tell you about a project that we've been working on. It's entitled the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Ch Protection Local Climate Action Program. And we're working with uh, Middleton Township, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Our liaison there is Mr. Nick Valla, who's the assistant township manager. And we're working with uh, Middleton Township to help them do their greenhouse gas inventory and create a, a climate action plan. We've been working on this um, both the fall and spring semesters. We had the pleasure of working with uh, Allie Founts and Trevor Welsh, uh, two junior environmental engineering students who worked on it in the fall semester fortunate to have a senior environmental engineering student who is joining for the presentation today. And Kayla will be talking about the uh, what she's working on this spring semester. Give you a little background about this project. It's offered by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's Energy Program. And in it, they're pairing uh, local go governments with college students across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the students are trained by the DEP contractor ICLA USA on how to develop a I'm sorry about that. It looks like we're running into some technical difficulties. I think what we'll have to do is, is close. Um, at this point, we will add that video to our, our posting on the Alumni Association webpage um, so that you're able to, um, to view and listen to that as well, since we are over our time here a little bit.